our final company for the night. Uh, they're focused on cancer and skin cancer, so oncology and dermatology. Last month, Inconthera raised 1.14 million through an oversubscribed placing with investors to fund the commercialization of Sol, a, Sol, a sun cream designed to prevent skin cancer. In September 2020, two successful skin cancer studies uh, surpassed expectations by demonstrating permutation on human skin. No doubt the guys will explain what this all means. And now commercial discussions are underway with two global cosmetic companies. I am delighted to be joined tonight by Tim McCarthy, Chairman, and Dr. Simon Ward, CEO at Incathera. Welcome, gentlemen. Good evening. Good evening, Donald. Uh, thank you very much for that introduction. And we're going to take the listeners through a short presentation and obviously Q&A. So hopefully Simon is going to drive the presentation for us. Um, but just to, uh, we, we are relatively new, I think, to a lot of your listeners on LSE. So first few slides are very much to introduce the company. And then we're going to concentrate on the product which you just highlighted, which was um, what we call Sol, which is a product we've developed for the prevention and treatment of skin cancers. It has a, a very exciting profile. So let's just um, take you through the first few slides. So the, the focus of the company is very much to develop novel medicines in the oncology area, i.e. the cancer area, through what we call targeted technology. So by targeting out our, our therapies, we are looking to make them more effective, but at the same time to either eliminate or at least minimize the side effects, and the typical side effects, which one sees um, quite commonly with, with, with oncology products. Now, looking at the, the heritage of the company, the background, um, we are a company that was spun out of the University of Bradford. So Simon, who's going to speak in a moment, uh, was the founder of the company, and he was approached by the university a number of years ago to see whether he could help to develop, in a commercial sense, some of the technologies which they were developing in the University of Bradford. And on the campus of Bradford is a dedicated facility called the Institute of Cancer Therapeutics, which um, is a four-story building housing about 50 researchers, um, both PhD students, right the way through professor level. And they're, they're doing some cutting edge research in the area of oncology. And some of those products were reaching the point where they needed to, what we call in, in the industry, throw them over the wall, i.e. From, from research into, into clinical development. Uh, and so they were looking for a solution. And, and uh, the solution was to spin out this company um, and if you look at the name of Institute of Cancer Therapeutics and squash it up, you get the name of Incanthera. So that's where, where we originated from, both in, in our heritage and our name. And um, without embarrassing Simon too much, um, the, the clever thing that he did at the time of establishing the company was to put together what we call a pipeline agreement with the university so that we get the first right to look at anything which the guys are doing there still. And they're, they're very, very active. Um, and that's very important for a company like ours, because as I'm sure a lot of your listeners tonight will appreciate, uh, you can't really run a, a company like this uh, as a one product company. So you need to have a portfolio, which we, we do have, both from products we've taken from university, we've taken three into the pipeline agreement so far, and also we've accessed products from outside. So we've got a, we've got a great portfolio of products which we're currently developing. In terms of the business model, it's slightly different from what um, a lot of the listeners will be used to in our sector. So they'll be used to companies um, taking products at a relatively early stage, looking to raise an enormous amount of money over lots and lots of different fundraisings in order to take those products through clinical development in the normal way, phase, phase one, two, and three. And that's very expensive. It takes a lot of time and um, it's very high risk. Now, the rewards, if you get it right, are stupendous, uh, but we've taken a, a very different approach here. So right from the beginning, we're clearly looking to acquire cutting edge technologies, both in oncology, which is our primary focus to begin with, and more and more in the area of dermatology as well. And once we've acquired those, those, those intellectual property rights or technology, we bring them in house, and you'll see the strap line on the bottom of the slide all the slides actually acquire, prepare, and commercialize. So we acquire, 
we prepare and what we mean by prepare is we do whatever technical development or clinical development we need to to get them ready for licensing and we only do what we need to do and that phrase is used particularly because we're not looking to keep these products in-house any longer than we need to so the the phrase that we use is we're looking to build up a portfolio of revenue generating licenses rather than a portfolio of cash um, uh, exhaustive if I can use that that word, cash exhaustive uh, products, which are long in clinical trials and very high in, in, in cost. So the commercial objective of the company is to get to a point where we're generating revenues and becoming profitable as quickly as possible. And then we would just keep adding to that revenue generation by bringing those products through as quickly as we can. And the product that we're going to speak a lot about this evening, um, the product Sol, is a really good demonstration of that. So the management team, I'm not going to go through everyone's CV. Um, Simon and I are obviously speaking this evening. Uh, but this is the, this is the company. Um, and the reason for this slide is just to give an overview of the, the skills and experience of, of the team, which, as you would expect, is, is very relevant for what we're doing, but also just to make the point that we are a virtual company. So we operate virtually, we keep the overheads to an absolute minimum, and we use the infrastructure of the industry where we need to, if we're doing clinical studies or, or any other sort of technical development. And then clearly on the commercial side, we then look, as I said before, to license that out um, as quickly as possible. Um, and if we go to the next slide, we've got um, the progress since we floated on the Aquis growth market. So obviously we were, we were a private company um, originally, and then we decided to go on to the public market. And just over a year ago, in fact, um, I think we, we beat the, the close down from the pandemic by about a month. Uh, but we floated on Aquis in February last year. We've had a fantastic um, year, both in terms of our profile in the market, but also in terms of the way we've brought forward Sol. And there's some highlights here, which I know Simon is going to cover in a lot more detail in a couple of slides time. But what that has meant from a public uh, uh, perception point of view and a public um, profile, I should say, is that we've had uh, very good um, progress in the share price and the valuation and also in the, the trading volumes as well, which um, is something we might talk about later on in the q and I think, but um, it's, um, we've had, a, I must say, a very, very good experience of listing onto the Aquas market. So if we go on to the next slide, this is the overview of the pipeline as we stand. So at the top, Sol, which we'll talk about in a moment, uh, EP15, which was in fact the, the product which Simon originally acquired in from the university, um, and we've already licensed that out, a company called Ellipsis, and they're now responsible for its development and, and its costing. And we've, we've, we've got a typical license deal with, with Ellipsis, whereby we are eligible for milestones and, and royalties as the um, on sales as the product develops. And then there's with two other uh, oncology products uh, just below those. We're not going to talk about those this evening because we are going to concentrate on Sol. But the message here is it is a portfolio and we have other uh, potential to bring products in from the university as well as other uh, external um, sources as well. So what I'm going to do here is hand over to Simon, if Simon doesn't mind, and he's going to do the technical bit. Um, and hopefully get you excited mm -hmm. about the, the prospects of Sol. Yeah, I, I promise I won't make it too technical. You know, it's about uh, 20 to 8 on, the, on a Tuesday evening. Um, uh, what, what, Sol is, is a really interesting product uh, and it's very exciting. It, it came to my attention um, through my past history working in the dermatology industry, actually, and running a dermatology company where I had the great, uh, great fortune to work with some of the UK's um, top, uh, actually worldwide, frankly, not just UK, but top formulators. And obviously, when we talk about anything to do with the skin, we really are interested in products that we can apply directly to the skin, because that is actually where the problem is, and that's where the, the challenge sort of resides. So formulation technology, which means getting something into a cream or an ointment or, or something that you can then apply to the skin and being able to deliver whatever is active within that pot is, is absolutely top priority for, for all of these products and, and all these um, companies. 
So when we talk about salt, we're talking about um, obviously cancers of the skin, as Tim has already mentioned. <clears throat> uh, but very importantly, we're, we're talking about something called solar keratosis. And solar keratosis is that first blemish that you will see when you are overexposed to the sunlight or, or UV induced destruction of the skin. And solar keratoses are, are an indicator, obviously, of skin that, that is actually starting to become prone to that cancerous um, progress. And solar keratoses will transform into certain cancers, particularly uh, squamous cell carcinoma. So it's a good indicator of a potential threat that's coming. Obviously, it's something that we don't really want to carry on the skin anyway. Um, so it's a very interesting part of this whole cancer process. And we'll come back to why, why I'm laboring that point in a little bit. But if we just look at skin cancers in general, I think everybody here listening will, will be aware of skin cancer and the problem that we're seeing in skin cancer is this almost precipitous rise that's, that's coming at us very, very hard, in fact. Um, just some of the stats that have been thrown out, melanoma, for instance, which I think is the cancer that everybody thinks about when we talk about skin cancer, which is deadly, obviously, has increased by 45% in the last 10 years. And that's a big rise uh, when you look at cancers in the general sort of population, particularly at the moment when actually Actually, most of the cancer data that's coming out in the last year or two um, is showing that cancers are being squashed. You know, we are starting to get on top of some of these, but not melanoma, sadly. Um, it's the fifth most common cancer in young adults. And this, this word young is starting to worry me. And particularly when you look at the next statistic that where we say it's increased by 70% in the 25 to 49 year olds. As a dermatologist, we would normally say skin cancer is a cancer of the old age because the longer you're exposed to the sun, the older you are, the more expo exposure you get, the more likely you are to actually contract one of these cancers. But actually, the demography has shifted and that 25 to 49 year old is a real problem group. And obviously, you can you can start looking at lifestyle choices and say, OK, it's young and affluent and we can now go on holidays to the sun and, and we don't take as much care as we should. And we've got misinformation on sun creams and what have you. But, you know, it is a stark fact that there is a population that really shouldn't be prone to these cancers, but are actually starting to show them in a big way. All of this interest, of course, and all of this problem has borne a huge uh, commercial market for some care products. You know, we're estimating it to be around the 14 billion mark by 2024. It is growing rapidly. And I think, you know, you can see that by walking in, into any pharmacy or any high street shop or any airport, frankly, um, when we're allowed to do that, of course. Um, and you see that whole range of a huge range of various sun creams and lotions and potions that, that are being sold to try and protect your skin from the sun. So let, let's think about this uh, in terms of what the skin is actually trying to do. We have a natural defense against uh, the, the sun's UV radiation and the UV radiation will do all sorts of different things. And I don't want to get into, into detail, but it will damage your DNA. Um, it's, it acts as an immunosuppressant. It strips energy from, from your cells. And all of these things can predispose you to mutations which become cancer. Within Sol, we have an ingredient that actually has long been known to, to actually help all of these cellular processes, it will actually help the skin um, repress these uh, interactions with UV radiation. In other words, it protects the skin from these issues. Um, so why haven't we been using it? Well, unfortunately, the only data that we've had so far with this particular additive, if you like, this ingredient has been through clinical trials where people have had to take it orally. And unfortunately, they've had to take literally bucket loads for about a year in some of the phase three clinical trials to actually get enough of this particular uh, compound to where it's needed. So if you think about it, you're putting it in your mouth and it's going through your body. It's hitting all of the, the bodily processes before eventually it gets disposed into the skin where it can do its job. So you do have to get a lot of the stuff down you. So it's actually really impractical, even though in phase three clinical uh, trials, we've shown that we have a significant reduction in the pro progression of actinic solar keratosis. So we're back to that word, actinic keratosis, and other precancerous lesions. And that's not just in, in normal people, uh, people who are worried well, who are going out to sunbathe, but it's also in a population of people who are predisposed to skin cancers. And that's important because if you really push the biology, so you're really looking at a group that almost will inevitably have a skin cancer at some point in their life, and you can pull that statistic back by using this particular compound, that's absolutely fantastic. And, and that's what we have here. So obviously, you, know, you put this in a cream, don't you? And you put it on your skin. And yes, that's exactly what we want to do. We want to put it in a cream, we want to put it on a skin, we want to get the delivery to the right place. And hey, presto, you've got, you've got that magic pot. So why hasn't it been done? Um, and that's a very good question. It's, it's been a bit of a baffling one for a lot of companies. 
this particular molecule, its chemical composition, just seems to make it really difficult to actually get hold of and put on the skin, drive it through the skin to where it needs to be to actually deliver these benefits. And because of, uh, of, of you know, my, my lucky uh, and uh, relationships with some of these formulators, um, one of those actually rang me up and said, I think we've cracked this particular problem. And that was a while ago. And, and that obviously led to solve a pot of cream that actually will take this particular active through the skin and deliver it in a pharmacologically active form to where it needs to be to prevent these cancers, touch wood. So we're very excited by that. I mean, just the fact that we've actually managed to, to conquer that particular obstacle. And um, we're excited because obviously putting something on your skin is far better than trying to eat it. When you're talking about skin diseases, you, you get rid of all of the problems of putting it through your body. We're actually used to rubbing things on our skin. We've got sun creams already. We know to put them on when we go out in the sun. So we're not really changing anything. This should be an easy pot to pick up and use and, and be very attractive in the marketplace. There are a couple of things though that we need to be sure before we start you know, jumping for joy. One, we actually need to know that it, it does do what we say it's going to do in an actual practical application. And the test here is a test called bioequivalence, which simply means that we're going to take our mode of delivery, in our case topical, and prove that we can get as much of the active through as was seen in the actual clinical study, which was by the oral routes. And this is called bioequivalence. And this, this was a set of experiments done at the School of Pharmacy, <coughs> who specialised in, in these particular experiments uh, back in the summer. And um, we, we had great results. I, I'm sure you've read the press releases, but they, they did actually exceed our expectations is, is the vocabulary we're using. And they, they really did. They not only um, showed bioequivalence, but in all of our concentrations tested, all of our formulations tested, they, they actually hit it out of the park, which is fantastic. And they beat other competitive products. Um, and I say competitor with, with a little bit of, of reticence because these products are at market, but they're not used for the treatment of certain keratosis or the prevention of cancers. They're used in other applications. Um, and we, we beat all of those products hands down in terms of the delivery of the active to the right place which is really, really exciting. And the second thing, of course, we need to know is that it's safe to use. And then anything that we put together that's new and we put on the skin, we need to know that it's non irritant So we put this in the standard battery of, of ex vivo tests. And again, we were absolutely hugely pleased with results. It was not only non irritant which is which is a category in its own right. It was also comparable to baby uh, sun protection cream. So this this is baby skin is the most sensitive skin you can ever imagine, um, and we were in the category that would allow us to put this on baby skin. So again, absolutely delighted that uh, that the formulation worked to that extent. So as, as you can see, we we sort of built a picture of a pot of cream that you can take with you, that you can put on. Um, we can have all of the sun protection factors in there if, if we so need to be, but in itself, it will actually start to put your skin in the best place it can possibly be to actually fend off contracting cancers. Uh, and, and the next, the next uh, point for this, this cream is obviously to try and get a, a licensing partner to take it off our hands and to, to get it into the marketplace as soon as possible. Um, and for that story, Tim, I think I'll hand back to you. Thank you, Simon. Yeah, the important message from this slide is um, that what we're doing in terms of getting salt to the market is we're going through the cosmetic route. And that's a really important uh, concept to take on board, because uh, as a lot of you will understand, when you go through the route of pharmaceutical, it's a long route. Uh, it's a lot of regulatory uh, conditions to meet, whereas we can split our uh, activity commercially into two, two ways. One is com um, cosmetic and the other is pharmaceutical at a later stage. So the cosmetic route allows us to get this product to the market very quickly. We've already opened discussions with uh, global and I emphasize global cosmetic companies. Uh, we obviously can't let you know who they are at the moment, but if we mention the names to you, you'd recognize them in an instant. And we're, 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 um, we put a notice out, uh, I think a couple of months ago, to say that we've started to prioritize those discussions that we're having, uh, and they're going very well. And obviously we'll update the market as we go forward. But the exciting thing from an investment perspective, but also in terms of getting the product to the market, is there is the potential that Sol could be on the market as early as next year. And when you compare that with the route to market for a pharmaceutical, then um, it's just like comparing chalk with cheese, clearly. 
but we do have the ability to withhold the rights to the pharmaceutical application to do a later deal with, with a pharmaceutical company. So we get two bites at, at the cherry. But the, uh, the near term upside for Incanthera very much is that when we get this deal signed, and then obviously people can see that quick route to market, then that is where I come back to my earlier slide of our business model, which is to build revenue streams quickly and generate um, cash generation and generate profits. Uh, that is the real um, close to market and close to business um, objectives that everyone is getting excited about now. Um, and if I can just put that into context, uh, you, you'll appreciate that this is the type of product which will most likely go into a sun cream of, of one sort or another. And that market is huge, as Simon has, has alluded to. So if a partner of ours puts this into their range or creates a new range and puts it on the shelves, then we're talking sales of hundreds of millions of dollars uh, per year. And we would expect to get a double digit royalty on that. So 10% upwards. Um, and of course, with the royalty stream, you've got absolutely no cost. So even being very conservative, 100 million uh, sales per year is 10 million revenue to us, which drops straight to the bottom line. And we've got a current market capitalization of 10 million. So I'm sure you can all do the numbers yourselves, but that's why people are getting quite excited about the prospects of Seoul. And then, of course, we've got other products coming behind that. Um, so really exciting times. Uh, we've just raised some cash um, last month in order to uh, see us through the next period. So we're nice and strong with a balance sheet. We have a good uh, negotiating position with potential partners. And um, we got some really, really good support, I have to say, from both institutions and, uh, and our existing shareholders. So the final slide, just to uh, wrap up, um, the focus is very much on delivering this commercial deal on Seoul. Uh, underneath that, uh, we, we feel we have um, an attractive business model and, and business objectives supported by a portfolio, which is not just reliant on one product, which is really important in our industry. An established oncology pipeline, but more and more, I think we're seeing the opportunity in the dermatology field as well. Um, we're a public company, obviously, through our ACUS listing, which we're, we're delighted with, I have to say. And uh, it's not particularly relevant this evening or right at the moment, but um, we, we've certainly benefited from being an EIS and BCT qualified company. So, Donald, I think we've, we've finished, we've wrapped up. So if you'd like to pick it up for Q&A, over to you. Fantastic. OK, what an interesting uh, company and what an interesting uh, line or three you threw out there. 10% uh, of 100 million conservatively, you said, is 10 million revenue to our bottom line. Could you, yeah. could you expand on that a little bit? Just, just talk yes, us through that. I think that was, that was the most exciting moment, I'm afraid. <laughs> Sorry, Simon. I thought that, I, I thought thought that might grab your attention. <laughs> yeah, I get that a lot, Donald, don't worry. <laughs> no, That's what you um, call a headline. <laughs> yeah, it's, it's, it's a bit unfair to Simon, actually, me sort of using that line, because it's, um, cause actually the most interesting part, if we're honest, is the technology behind Sol, because that's right. what's getting potential partners really, really excited. But if we, if we just turn to the numbers, uh, when we put these numbers out, we're trying to be realistic and not just trying to chuck out big numbers. But as you'll appreciate, uh, in, in both the pharmaceutical industry, but also the cosmetic industry, when you've got a product which works, it does sell enormous amounts every year. And uh, to say that a product like Sol could, could sell something like 100, 200, 300 million, it's, it's quite normal in our industry. So I'm being very conservative when I'm, when I'm using a figure of 100 million sales. And typically when you do these license deals, um, you would go for around a double digit royalty. So make it easy for everyone to calculate, you should 10%, obviously. Um, and we would, um, we would look to protect that by putting in minimum royalties um, per year, such that, you know, as, as the company is gearing up the, the sales levels, we get a minimum level of income. But yeah, the numbers are very simple. It is 10% of 100 million is 10 million roughly to us per year. And, and, the, and the market your, size is simply, simply huge, as you said. Well, Sorry. it is, yes. And you, you, you relay that back to where we are today. And we're about a 10 million market capitalization. Well, it's not easy to see where the growth can come very quickly in Incanthera, just on this one product. Yeah, I mean, everyone can do their own PE ratios and market and DCF calculations. 
uh, and then and you still get the ten percent even if you even if you hold back the the ph pharmacological elements of, yeah, the, of the deal. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah, um, the license deals we're able to do are specific to uh, market or use, whichever way you you want to define it. So very much the cosmetic route is the one we've chosen to get it to market quickly and start generating revenue. But we will retain the rights of the pharmaceutical development, which will go you know, to a typical pharmaceutical company in time. Yeah. Okay, so Steve uh, Bakovich, you tell me what you think of this. He says that your shares are fairly liquid. What can you do to enable investors to buy shares at a reasonable bid offer spread? Okay, this is, a, I think, a question which is, correct me if I'm wrong for the, for the, for the, the person asked the question, but maybe directed towards the aqueous market, I don't know, because um, clearly if you compare on, in a, with a typical company, trading on AIM, for example, versus the Aquis market, you'll see a lot more trading liquidity on an, on an AIM stock. But we've been, we've had a very good experience on Aquis. We've, as I said on an earlier slide, we've, we've been on the market for about a year. We've seen our trading volumes and liquidity increase quite considerably over the last couple of months. And we, we expect to see that increasing. And in fact, um, we did a little exercise in the last couple of days looking at trading volumes on Aquis generally. And you will see that those volumes are increasing uh, quite considerably. And um, I skipped over it actually, but in one of the earlier slides, uh, it mentioned that um, Incanthea had been promoted into the apex section of the, uh, the market. So Aquis have now split it into the apex and access market. So access is for the smaller um, new companies onto the market and Apex is for the, um, the the larger and growing companies. So I think the market has somewhere between 90 and 100 companies and 20 of those approximately have, have been promoted to the Apex market. And we're delighted to be invited to join that market because not only demonstrates that, you know, we're of a certain size, but also um, it's, it's led to a, a narrowing of the spread. If you look at our bid offer, uh, spread it's very very narrow so that encourages trading in itself because as i'm sure a lot of your listeners or active investors will know if you've got a very wide spread it makes it almost impossible to, to buy in and out of the stock so we're extremely pleased with that and uh, yeah about a couple of months i think the apex market has been um, going now and we've seen a, a a tremendous difference in the in the volumes and the trading and, and the pricing of the stock so you know my my own belief is that given time, and I don't think it's be a lot, long time, in the next year or two years, that Aquis will more and more take the place of the sort of lower end of the AIM market, you know, certainly up to 100 million market cap that uh, you'll see in companies on, on AIM now and trading. So, and, and, yeah, uh, very can interrupt you there, can, uh, Tim, do you expect yeah, the absolutely. market cap increase? Which is a, a daft question ever to ask a chairman, because I mean, <laughs> what else are you supposed to say? But do, do you do you see the possibilities for growth there? Well, it, it, it listen. Uh, it, it just goes back to delivery. You know, we 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 we're, we're setting out our stall, and um, certainly in the first instance, Sol is is the route through to that. And as I mentioned before, Donald, um, we can't stay at ten million if we're starting to generate ten million revenues per year. <laughs> you know, the, it just doesn't work. Um, and and I, I think there will be a certain anticipation also of the next few months of us entering into that sold deal. So I would expect the volumes to increase. I expect the, the share price to start ticking up in anticipation. And then obviously once those revenues start generating, then we should see a, a bit of an explosion, I believe. And where exactly are you in your commercial discussions? Okay. Um, I'm going to actually uh, chuck it over to Simon, otherwise I'm going to sort of dominate this conversation. <laughs> um, Simon, do you, do you want to pick that one up? Yeah, we, 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 we're out there we're, and, and we, are, we are talking, as we said, we, we are concentrating on two, two global cosmetic companies at the moment. Um, we, we have reached out to uh, a large number of companies um, and I have to say, you know, we, we haven't been turned down by any of them so far, which has been great news. But clearly, you know, you need to do this in the stepwise progression and make sure you get the right deal that, that does, does the right thing for the product and the company. So we're, we're being very careful with our, with our two potential partners.
Okay, now that I'm with you, Simon, can I ask you, your <laughs> background is in dermatology. Yeah. Uh, yeah. You've clearly seen a market opportunity uh, there. Would you, would you like to take the company further into the dermatology space? Yeah, I, I think, you, you know, oncology actually and dermatology from scientific basis are, are fairly well related. You know, the skin is the biggest organ in the body. So, yeah, it has all the same sorts of problems as any other organ does, including a whole plethora of cancers and what have you. But also a lot of the root causes of skin diseases, you know, such as hyper proliferation are common in both cancer and, and skin disorders so that there is a quite nice overlap from the biological uh, human biology perspective but from a market perspective you know dermatology does allow us this neat angle of actually getting to market faster if we can find an acquire technology that will point towards the, the cosmeceutical is, is the buzzword but that cosmetic sort of world um, and obviously for a small company that turning over which is our which is our mantra obviously acquire prepare and commercialize turn over turn over turn over these products get them into licensees hands if we can do that faster why not so you find yourself a sweet spot how does a that fit spot. with uh, how does that fit with your existing portfolio how does that fit with your relationship with the university of bradford Oh, actually, I mean, it, it fits really nicely with Bradford. To some extent, Bradford have one of the UK's leading skin centres anyway. So, you know, we will be we will be talking to them a little bit more wider about that at some point, I am sure. Um, but we have a great relationship with Bradford and, and there are other, you know, non-skin cancer opportunities still within within Bradford portfolio. So, yeah, I, it's, it's great for all of us. OK, gentlemen, I, I know you can't believe it, but we are actually <laughs> out of time. Sadly, okay. sadly uh, you can have too much of a good thing. Well, I have to say thank you so much uh, to you guys. That was, that was fantastic. Well worth waiting for.